the growing calls across the nation to defund the police. To end policing as we know it. Off the charts violence in New York City. 11 people shot in just eight hours on Sunday. This is Sunday. about the police officers, officers who every single day put on that uniform and they run towards danger when we run away from it. Oh, guns up, baby. My I muted. Okay. All right. Well, that was awkward. Sorry for the listeners out there. I'm not sure where. And get it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's Pride Mike. Yes. Oh, Pride Mike is in the house. Pride Mike. It's in the. Yes. It's in Pride Mike. <laughs> Guys, we have a special guest. I didn't even know he was going to be here tonight. We have Pride Mike, everybody. Pride, Pride Mike on it's Pride Mike. It's time Mom. to be a capitalist. <laughs> Capitalize this on sexuality. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, man. I love how he overshot the rule. <laughs> oh, man, his headphones almost came off. <laughs> Pride like, Mike. I almost came off. It's like date Mike on, all, on The Office. It's Pride, oh, it's Pride. Pride Mike. Nice to meet yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, dude. Hey, you remember? Remember, I said like a couple of weeks ago, or like a week at the beginning of this whole ordeal, that I said like if we were to have St. Patrick's Month, we would all be a bunch of drunken degenerates, and that's why they have a St. Patrick's Day, not a St. Patrick's Month. Right, right. If we would have had a gay day, we wouldn't be where we're at right now, two weeks into this shit show, because now there's no real pride about it. Now it's just a fetish fest. You got fucking Christina Aguilera jerking off a Hulk dick dildo at her concert. <laughs> like true. it's gone too it's far. True. Like we've all yeah. become degenerates. Like for an all ages show, you know, we could have just been super gay for a day, got it all out of our system, but you let this shit go on for a month. And now you've got basically like ba basically right now we're just celebrating mental health issues. <laughs> It's devolved. It's devolved. My it's friend. gone hey, listen, downhill. Listen, uh, super quick. A uh, couple things. First of all, let's let's play this clip from NBC. This is for entertainment purposes and educational purposes only. Not original to us. From NBC. NBC. And, and it's from Law and Order, so it's show related. Go ahead and play it. I am not gay. I have relationships with women and sex with men. And I got news for you. That means you're gay. <laughs> <laughs> His face. His face. A look of dejection. He's like, no. Of indignation. No. <laughs> I can't be. How does Pride Mike feel about that? Pride Mike is fully supportive. Of everything that that man represents. <laughs> Lasra Lopez says, "Gay for a day is the name of my new nonprofit charity." <laughs> <laughs> we help go kids total... go, go explore gayness for one full day. Gay for a day. Welcome it, to GFAD. It's like, but instead it's, of like Make like a Wish make Foundation, a wish. yeah, it's it's, <laughs> it's a it's a gay wish, and you just want to be gay for a day with no repercussions. Yeah, it's called Make a Squish. <laughs> <laughs> Ew. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know Who left the uh, producers talking right about over? I'm so sorry. Uh, anyway, welcome to the Failure to Stop podcast. This is the number one show where law enforcement meets culture. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> what is He's. I can't. <laughs> what is that? I'm glad he thinks it's funny. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> I don't know. I don't need. I haven't had enough hard AFs for this.
Oh man, I'm I'm literally crying so far. I'm gonna turn my mic off. <laughs> I uh, I'm I'm cr- literally have tears from. The- <laughs> I'm sorry, it's me. Making- <laughs> I don't know what it is. Okay, anyway, this is the Failure to Stop podcast, where law enforcement meets culture. This is Night Shift, baby. We are gonna talk a true crime story tonight. Uh, if I, you're you're gonna have to tell me if I'm pronouncing the name wrong, which is a, a risk with you anyway. Jennifer Shewitt, is that? <laughs> Yeah, that's what I got from this. Okay. Uh, Crazy case. I have never heard of it. Uh, Tansy says that uh, a lot of stuff. uh, Thank you for the moniker on my screen. Uh, A lot of stuff about this is hitting the news again. So he's going to tell us this story tonight. I'm going to react. We're going to interact with this. We'll talk about the law enforcement aspect. We'll talk about the, uh, the, the crime hunting aspect where basically the victim of this crime, if I understand when what happened when she was eight, she ends up helping to find her own assailant. And we'll talk all about that. Tansy's going to tell us that story tonight. But this is Night Shift. Uh, another, we'll see where it goes, man. Up to this point, we, we've, Night Shift is like an experimentation. Would you say that? It's like a test tube? I don't know. It's like our test tube podcast, baby. Yeah, I mean, I think, we, I think we're dialing in Night Shift. Uh, we've been kind of like trying to figure out what to do for Night Shift to keep cops awake at night uh or first responders in general but i think i think we've dialed it in we'll do our thing tonight and then next week we'll try one more thing yeah i think you guys are gonna like next week i have a really good feeling about about what we're gonna try next week so stay tuned we do broadcast (laughs) live on our youtube channel every tuesday night at 8 p.m eastern and every friday morning for the flagship (laughs) show at 11 o'clock in the morning eastern time but we have three other shows monday is off the cuff with myself and Dave and Law Enforcement News. Tuesdays is Disruptors. Another kick butt episode came out today. Thursdays is Last Call with Tans and the Overpaid Producer, giving you all the pop culture news you need to be a normal person on the weekends. And whoa, did you just hear that? What? That's the sound of 30% off with Code Drinking Bros for Ghost Bed, one of our sponsors for this show. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, I heard that. I actually had you. It's like it's somebody. Break into our building. <laughs> it no. must be Pride Month because that was the gayest ad read ever. <laughs> I was like, "What? What is it? You just pointed it? that right at me. What is it? Did you discipline? Come on, that's why I right. throw away anyway, gun. Uh, yeah, the show is brought to you by Ghost Bed. Listen, at this point, we all have Ghost Beds. We all love it. You all know it, and you better buy it. Okay, like ninety percent of our reviews on Apple Podcasts talk about Ghost Bed and putting Rip Pack up your butthole, but uh on a ghost bed so drinking bros d-r-i-n-k-i-n-b-r-o-s saves you 30 percent yes even on some of these bigger sales like back in memorial day uh when a couple of people got them uh i know a local cop to me messaged me she got a ghost bed had the memorial day sale and still saved the 30 percent with the code drinking bros sleep so good it's scary it's awesome get it does that cover our ghost bed read it does uh, I think you did a great, a great job. Huge fans, big Go fans, ahead. and I big sleep fans. on one every freaking night. I'm really nervous because we're supposed to move this weekend. There's a chance that we can move our stuff, but may not be able to sleep at, in the house. So my ghost bed is going to be there, and I may have to stay. That's going to suck at my dad's house on our old mattress or on an air mattress. The air mattress isn't bad for an air mattress that we have, but still, I'm going to be ghost bedless, and I'm very worried about my physical well being. So, so do you have to put your ghost bed back into a box to move it? No, you got to kind of like roll it up and I'm going to, uh, not bungee cord it, but what do they call those? Uh, ratchet strap, ratchet straps. Yeah. I'm going to ratchet strap it. I don't know how to Google Google web drive, but I know how to ratchet strap. <laughs> oh, come on up. Web Google web drive. Can you know, check the, Hey, Elijah, can you check the Googles for, uh, for these images? <laughs> What bothers me the most is that our producers always know what I'm trying to say, but they like want to shark me because I don't say it correctly. Yeah. I hate yeah, they, that. They tech shame. It's you. like, you know what I'm trying to say? The Google web drive. Crazy. You know I what think it is. He, I think tech shaming falls under the anti Q and LGBTQ. So you, it's, it's very inappropriate for this month, to be honest with you. I've got the I, one thing I that we did. Offensive. 
where we were like, I think it was, <clears throat> oh man, it was back when I was in the old studio, but I told you that I needed something done into StreamYard. And you're like, what do you, what StreamYard, what are you doing with StreamYard? And I was like, you know, this, the StreamYard. And you're like, no, we don't use StreamYard anymore. And I'm like, okay, well the thing that we stream in now. And they're like, uh, we don't use StreamYard. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> whatever we do the video in, that's what I'm trying to say. Obviously I don't know the name. Then the very next week I go, Hey, did you guys upload into blah, blah, blah? And they're like, yeah, we're not using that anymore. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, we use StreamYard. It's called trial I remember that. and error, man. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Do we not remember the fit I threw last week when you guys couldn't figure out what I... I get it. Okay. If you want to support the show, you can do things like Conserving Liberty just did and become a member of our YouTube channel live oh. in the chats. Listen, to kick off the chat tonight before we dive into our story, and yes, on YouTube, when you're playing this back and you're like, when the heck are these guys going to start talking about it? I will put a little chapter thing. So if you want to skip all the banter, that's really awesome. And just get into it. You can do that. But Conserving Liberty just became a member on our YouTube channel. Has some extra perks like watching all of our shows get recorded live. Even the ones that we don't like broadcast and live stream. So lots of little things going. Everything's developing. We love it. In the chat though, kick it off tonight. What are some things that you can say in Pride Month that you can't say in any other month? Come up with Wait, some what funny are some things sentences. that you can say in Pride Month? Yes, yeah, so you, you can't can say speak, other months. You can say them in Pride Month, but you can't say them other months. I'm just curious if how creative the chat can be here. Okay, and, and it's a good time watching in the chat and participating, guys. So if you're listening to this and you're like, man, maybe I should get the YouTubes and participate in this. Well, yeah, yeah you should. I right. wish someone would kick in my back door. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, yeah, it's gonna get interesting in there. You got mail call? What do you got? Yeah, somebody sent a package. It's super heavy. This must have cost a lot of money to ship. Oh, there's a note on the flap. Oh, my gosh. This that is like so high good, Grandma. Wait. Oh, my gosh. Okay, here we go. One, this is from Sarah Kelch. Her address is 6601 <laughs> North. <laughs> All right, it says, Dear Little Spoon, after hearing you tell your story about pooping in the ocean and shoving it out of your shorts with your hands. I thought you may need this stuff more than I do. I get this stuff for free from work. So if you need any more, just let me know. Make sure you use every bit of it. I'm begging you. If I ever do get the chance to meet you and you tackle me, I want you to be clean as fuck just as much as you are hard as fuck. Enjoy your cute little 14 year old looking thing. Oh, 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 ah, ah. <laughs> oh stop. No. It says looking 14 year old looking fan that's because a, she does hard. look 14, but she's in her 20s. <sighs> Sarah Kelch, guns up, giddy up. P.S. I meant to get this to you sooner, but procrastinated <laughs> hard as fuck. So sorry. Listen about to that. this, Edwin. Edwin's comment about what you can say in Pride Month, but not other months. <laughs> I told my boss I was late because I was banging dudes. Because I was banging dudes. Banging dudes, man. Fat boomdi. Fat boomdi. Let's see what it is here. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my gosh. Well, I got some Grove Company hydrating hand soaps, a thousand of them. I got nice. some seventh generation wipes, a thousand of them. Is really wondering the, uh, why their loss prevention is uh, <laughs> yeah. is Dude, there's failing. even like <laughs> organic hand sanitizer. Just straight up stole that shit. You know it's true. Uh, more <laughs> hand sanitizer. What is he going to do? Go to your manager at Taco Bell and be like, I need this stuff. What the <laughs> fuck is this? Something to change my oil in my car with. <laughs> Oh shit! Look like some antifreeze. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Oh my gosh! Change oil in your car. At energy boost. How do you get an energy boost with body wash? We'll wow. find out. Well, why does your work have body wash? What the <laughs> fuck are y'all doing there? Uh, more hand. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff. Thank you. That's why. All it's I got so is heavy. a little teddy bear. What the hell, bro? She must work at Baldwin's bathhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we'll pull your trigger. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Whew. Good job, Sarah. All right. That's uh, I guess that's all the housekeeping and all the fun. It's, it was fun. It was, it was a fun, fun intro. We just went so hot in this studio. I am. Uh, I have sufficiently laughed. To no, Sarah Kelch. I've never heard of Grove Collaborative because I only celebrate gay day. And it's too much to learn. In June one 1st. One day. That's it. 
<laughs> All right, we are going to dive into, <clears throat> excuse me, we are going to dive into the story of Jennifer Shewitt. So I'm ready. Tell it to me, baby. Let's go. Let's get dark. Let's get dark, it's, dude. Turn the mood it's not down. A, it's, it's not a feel good story, guys. So actually, it kind of is a feel good story. Well, yeah. It's got a happy ender. <laughs> That <laughs> feels really bad. Uh, in her defense, I tried to reach out to Miss Shewitt on the social web, see if she wanted to come on, but I didn't get any response. So, did you? Did they even open it though? Like, did you send it on Instagram or something, or did you? Yes, yeah, send it on Instagram. Yeah. Did they open yeah. it? How would I know? I don't, I don't have. It ESPN. says, dude, it's literally a feature of direct messages, whether they've opened it or seen it or not. I don't pay for Instagram. I only have the. Um, <laughs> like beginner account for Instagram. The basic plan? Yeah. Okay. Like basic. Fair enough. <laughs> the peasant plan. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is the story of Jennifer Shewitt. Uh, she was an eight-year-old girl at the time of the story when it took place. Uh, I have a seven-year-old son and a nine-year-old son, so I'm kind of familiar with the age here. And uh, I, I cannot imagine something like this happening to any of my kids friends or to my kids or anything like that. So the fact that her mother and her had to live through this is, it's very sad, but it's, it's almost one of those stories. And when I get into it, there's so many fine details that the planets had to align perfectly for this to even happen. Mm -hmm. that It was almost like yeah. it was meant to happen. Yeah. Like I wonder if because of this, it saved some kind of other life way down the line. At least I'd like to think that. But this is a very odd story with some really, like I said, odd uh, turns in it that that really, if the planets weren't aligned perfectly, none of this would have happened. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, you know, we talked about Uvalde and our Uvalde breakdown. And, and, you know, sometimes just bad shit happens. Sometimes we get just, we get unlucky. We leave a door open that shouldn't have been open or a door doesn't lock that should have been locked or a window is left open that shouldn't have been. I mean, just things happen, man. And then bad shit happens. And in this case on the evening of, uh, I believe it was August, 1990. Um, it was August 9th, 1990. Jennifer typically sleeps with her mom. Now her mom and them live in Gal her, her and her mom live in Galveston, Texas. Her mom works a lot. She's got a couple of jobs, more than one, but she's very, very close to her daughter. Her dad is in prison or in and out of jail. Um, and a couple of her documentaries, a couple more of her interviews, she references what it was like to, to meet her dad in, in jail and ask a lot of questions. And that's kind of where she got this like inquisitive questioning eight year old kind of mindset you know have you ever met those kids that just like ask why about everything yeah well, why? Kind of, usually it's like a well, phase usually like five years old six years right. old and then it becomes like well why but why but why <laughs> exactly she's gonna have this at like eight like where she's just looks like she's actually in one of her uh tell laws she's like stated that like sometimes she would get in trouble for asking so many questions like just pay attention and you'll find out why um so she and her mother actually are in the process of moving into an actual house right now. They're going to be living in an apartment complex. It is a two story apartment. They live on the bottom floor and their windows face the parking lot. And, and, and so they go to this house and they're working on the yard and they're cutting back all the grass because they're going to be moving into this house. I believe she was trying to buy the house or she just bought the house and they were going to move into it. Either way, um, Elaine and Jennifer were working at the house all day and she's going to get bit up by mosquitoes um, and, you know, just typical yard work stuff, right? Yeah. So she goes home and she climbs into bed with her mom because she's a single mom. She's got her daughter. She doesn't have a dude in the bed. There's not any guys running up in, in and out of the house. This is, you know, like a solid, stable, single mother. But she sleeps with her eight-year-old every night. And I don't think there's a problem with that. I don't think that's unnatural um but this particular night mama had to get up real early in the morning and because jennifer was scratching her legs and kicking at her she was like honey can you please go sleep in your room tonight i have to sleep tonight i have to get to sleep early and you're driving me nuts and 
she had rarely slept in her own bed. I mean, it was a very rare occurrence. Like once every couple months did she go and sleep in her own bed. Okay. So she gets out, she goes in her room, she turns her lamp on, according to her. She grabs her piggy bank and a teddy bear. She puts the piggy bank and the teddy bear on the bed and she begins to count her change until she falls asleep. So Jennifer falls asleep and the next thing she knows, she wakes up to a nightmare that's not a dream, but is actually reality. She wakes up in the arms of a stranger running down the street. She tries to scream, but the stranger covers her nose and mouth with his hand and says, shh, it's okay. I'm an undercover police officer. Hmm. How fucked up is that? Well, well, I mean, it's, it's hard to not put myself in the position of a parent right and think right. wow how does that make me feel and uh rage is, is what's one good word that it makes me feel uh yeah man that is that is I mean, crazy I can't weird. even imagine my 7 or 8 year old waking up in the arms of some stranger yeah and that's what's running crazy is like when you these kinds of situations, probably, I mean, probably just about every sort of like true crime story or all of that, you know, genre, it's just like, it is funny when you think about how life is like that, right? Where it's just like something simple as yard work leading to mosquito bites, leading to scratching your legs too much. And mom says, Hey, I need you to stay in your own bed. Like where you could confidently feel like that wouldn't have happened. If that sequence of events <laughs> right. hadn't unfolded of just seemingly normal stuff, like the, in the total inability to predict that something like that would happen, you know, knowing that it's not likely if a, an adult was in in the room with them, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of mind get, blowing to sort of think about the odds yeah. of sort of like that happening. And it's going to get even weirder odds because when you figure out this guy's motive and everything, you're even going to be like, Whoa, I mean, everything, the lawn, as you mentioned, the scratching, the sleeping in the bedroom, the, even the lamp being on is going to be a, a factor in this. Yeah. So she wakes up, she's told to be quiet that he's an undercover police officer. He throws her into a vehicle and holds her down on his lap and begins to drive. And he just kept telling her to calm down, that everything was going to be okay. And he just kept reassuring her that he was an undercover police officer. Um, he allowed her to kind of sit up, but he had a grasp of her, like by the back of the hair. And as she's driving down the road, she sees her grandparents' house. And he says, and, and she will later go on to, to recant or to, to kind of re-remember these kind of things. And she says that when she left out of the guy's, in this guy's car and he pulled out, she noticed that her mother's car was still in the parking lot. And she remembers being afraid of like, okay, well, where's my mom? Why does this cop have me? Where is my mom? And do you, do you know if the, is this like a house or is this like an apartment complex? This is up. This is remember. This is the bottom floor of the apartment. Okay, with the windows facing the a parking lot. Okay, so she sees her mom's car, and that's when she was like, "I was kind of worried because if this was a cop, but my mom was still there. What's going on with my mom?" And they're driving. And remember, she's eight. What a strange I mean, thing to so remember young. as an eight-year-old. Yeah, in a in a stressful situation. She's actually going to do a great job of remembering everything. She's going to remember a lot, which is going to solve this case. Let me but, let me ask you this. And I don't want to jump ahead, but do okay. you do you think that saying that he was a police officer created enough initial calmness in the confusion for her brain to actually keep working like that? You know what I'm saying? Probably. Like, if if she, if if he would have been like. 
I'm an attacker and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to you. Maybe she wouldn't have had the frame of mind to continue to think about her surroundings or, you know, the awareness of her situation. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that like, you know, I, I remember watching in game when Duke was eight years old and I remember, do you remember in game where it just kind of ends and it's like super bad. I'm not going to spoil it for anybody, but like, you know, the it? crazy and, uh, Oh, Avengers. Avengers. I'm just thinking, if I don't hear Avengers Endgame, I just, yeah, anyway, yes. So I remember I looking remember. at him and him being so confused. And I mean, he was like, uh, it's over? Is it? And we were laughing. I actually have it on video because I knew the ending was coming. And so I had video this ending. I'll try to post it to Instagram. But this look of like confusion and desperation and like, I don't <laughs> understand this because he was so invested in the movie. And then it just ends the way it does. And his br little tiny brain couldn't comprehend. And he was like, this isn't right. Like, who wrote that movie? Like, he couldn't get off of it. Now imagine a thousand times more stress, same yeah. age. Yeah. This girl's like, uh, I don't know what's going on. Like, I was sleeping. And now I'm in some dude's car. And he's holding me by the back of the neck, telling me he's a police officer. What is going on? So it's they, they take off driving down the road. And they get a little ways down the road. And she notices her grandmother's house and granddad's house where she, where is where she spends most of her time. So my mom's at work. She's always with grandma and granddad. And so she tells the attacker, Hey, there's my grandma's house. She's home. Drop me off there. And he was like, no, she's not home. And she goes, well, her car's there. <laughs> and the attacker's like, uh, they're not home. So, she thinks maybe going back to this might have led to the confusion that made him just stop in the elementary school parking lot where she goes to school. And now they're just sitting in the parking lot and he's breathing heavily and he tells her to watch the moon. And when the moon changes colors, her mom will pull up and pick her up. And they waited for about five to 10 minutes. Why? What's going on here? Wait for the moon to change colors. And she was thinking in her brain, what the, like, what, the, the moon doesn't even change colors. I don't even know if the, the thing. So she remembers sitting there looking at it to change colors, but it never turned colors. And then he says, uh, well, I guess she's not coming. And she says, well, hang on. If you're a cop, where is your gun in your badge? Shouldn't you have a big giant gun and a big giant badge? And as she's saying this, he's driving just a couple of blocks down the road. They're, they're literally have pulled out of the school while she's asking this and they get to a gravel dead end. And he says, yeah, my gun and badge is in the back seat. Elijah, will you play what I want? I want to, I don't, I can't, I don't want to tell this part of the story. We'll talk about it, but she actually tells this portion of the story. So I'll let our listeners hear it from her voice told me that my mom was going to pull into the parking lot to pick me up soon, and she never came. He started up his vehicle about five minutes after he told me that, but it seemed like it was forever. And he drove me about a mile past my, my school to an overgrown lot off of a short gravel road. And it was there that um, I started to question him being a police officer. I was a very curious eight-year-old little girl and would ask a lot of questions. So I started to ask him, well, if you're a police officer, where's your gun? Where's your badge? You know, prove this to me. At one point, he told me that his gun was in the back seat. So I stood up on the front bucket seat of the car to look into the back. And whenever I did that to try to see where his gun was located, he ripped my panties off of me. He then laid me down in the front seat of the vehicle, climbed on top of me, and started to lick me all over my body. There, after this point, are times where I black out from him either choking me or trying to break my neck. Um, the next thing I remember was waking up and him dragging me behind him um, through this field by my ankles. So I could feel like sticks poking me in the back, thorns, but I just stayed silent and um, played dead at one point, not even realizing that during one of those times that I had blacked out, he had actually slit my throat from ear to ear. He what? laid me in a fire ant pile soon after that and what? then left. 
Um, I laid in the field for 12 to 14 hours. We don't know the exact time that I was kidnapped, so uh, we can only estimate it was about 12 to 14 hours after the attack occurred. I was found by a group of children playing tag in this field and was life flighted to John Silly Hospital, um, which is part of the University of Texas Medical Branch on Galveston Island. And I stayed there for two weeks being treated for a lacerated throat and trachea. So, dude. so the way, and that was just kind of like a, a quick synopsis of it. She, she has a, a much darker tale of that on uh, 48 hours, but she talks about um, that the little boys that find her, the one they were playing tag in a field and she was only, I think it was like six feet off of the end of the road. So where that gravel road had ended. She was only like six feet off of it. Yeah. So Jake asked, how did she not bleed out? I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, man, did he, did he just not he know what missed, he was doing? It was a pocket knife and it wasn't a deep enough. The, the pocket knife didn't go deep enough to get to her jugular. But it ripped through her trachea and through her throat. And, and, and the doctors are going to tell her she'll never talk again. She'll never, she'll never be able to speak again. But with technology as technology advanced, she, she obviously she's talking again. But mm -hmm. she'll, she'll, she'll kind of remember laying in this field. And after he left and she was kind of looking up at the night sky and she went to yell. And that's when she learned that she physically couldn't. And she said it was just a terrible feeling of just physically can't yell because her voice box has been sliced wide open. Um, he laid on a pile of fire ants. Yes. And she what could a, not I, move. I even fathom how one human does that to another person. And I doubt he kid, knew. I, I doubt he like looked around for a fire ant pile and left her in it. You know what I mean? He probably just drug her out there and dropped her and it just happened oh. to be in a fire fire ant pile. Um, but she went to pick her head up when the sun came up because she knew she was safe because he was gone and she went to lift her head and her head wouldn't move. She could not physically get her head up. So she couldn't physically scream and she couldn't get her head up and she just laid there blacking out, coming in and out of consciousness, just staring like unable to move until a little boy trips over her thinks it's a dead body runs all the way home. So like, think about that. You're laying there in a field covered in ants, a boy trips on you and then runs away. You're like, and you can't say like, no, 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 no. Stop, 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 stop. You're just like laying there. So the guy, the kid runs home, tells his mom, they found a body, a dead body. And when they find her, she is still alive. So they life flight her. The detective that gets on the plane with her is already coordinating this as a homicide. Doesn't think she's going to make it. And he documents that she's covered in human bite marks. And I she has a lacerated throat. This. I hate this. Man. And she's naked. So pretty sick, right? Like, yeah, that means he bit her a bunch and enough that while they're on a helicopter, a detective's like, those are human bite marks all over her. Oh, so he wasn't just licking her in that front seat. He was biting her. Also, she had been sexually raped. He had penetrated her. Uh, now, she does not remember that, but the evidence, uh, which is going to create her not to be able to have children later on because of the damage. And I'll, I'll read about what kind of damage was done there, but there's, you know, proof that he did rape her, even though she doesn't recall that part of, of that, which thank God that the human body can shut off and shut shit out like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like that it can be like, yeah, this is where it gets really bad. Yeah, you don't need to off. remember this. Let's, yeah, just, uh, we'll let's just, just stop, stop the tape. <laughs> right. So they get her to the hospital and they quickly begin to work on her. And as she keeps coming in and out, she just had this look of fear, according to her nurse. Now, her nurse is pretty important here. Um, the, the nurse is Sharon McBride. And Sharon is going to kind of stay with her through this whole thing because she has an eight-year-old daughter. 
and uh, and and this whole thing kind of hits home to her. Um, and, and go ahead and show those pictures if you're not on our YouTube's. You should get on our YouTube's and watch it. But here's the pictures of her as she's getting. Now you see that her eyes are completely bloodshot, and that was because he crushed her throat and tried to break her neck, and her eyes filled with blood. I hope if this guy is, I hope if he's dead, I hope that it was so brutally painful. And if he's still alive, I hope he is in constant misery. Now the mom, Davy asks, where is the mom during all of this asleep? She doesn't know. Uh, and it's, this is 12 hours later the, the the mom wakes up, she freaks out and she calls 911 and her daughter's missing. You know, let's, let's talk about that. So you're in the other room. You've told your daughter to go to her room. She turns her lamp on. She gets her piggy bank out. She goes to sleep. You wake up, get ready for work, go into her room to, to grab her, to take her over to grandma and grandpa Papa's house. And you realize she's not in her bed. And you walk around your small apartment at five o'clock in the morning and you can't find her. What kind of panic, what kind of panic sets in for a mother? When she calls 911 and she talks to the media, she's almost, un, uh, you can't understand her. She said, this is all I have. This is, the, this is all I have. Whatever she's at, bring her back. This is all I have. I mean, she can't even produce words because of the grief. I mean, this is her best friend. I mean, this is her child. So, you know, luckily 12 hours, you know, and it's, it's not even 12 hours because remember this happened somewhere at night. So they're going to find her pretty early in the morning. So, um, and this is a the police department of three, mind you. They only oh, have wow. three people in this police department. Um, so they had gotten every firefighter. One of those smaller ones on Galveston Island. There's like, there's like these little small. Yeah, there are, there are several tiny little departments on Galveston Island. Wow. So, um. Sharon McBride, the pediatric ICU nurse, she's going to quote, uh, I was on night shift coming onto the unit and noticed right away that there were a police guard outside the room standing there and looking at Jennifer, this little eight-year-old girl in this bed that had suffered this horrendous trauma and knowing that I had an eight-year-old little girl at home, my heart ached for her. And what on earth was her, was her life going to be like even after all of this if she lives? How was this going to affect the rest of her life? The majority of my shift was sitting there at her bedside. Even at night, if she was sleeping, I was there. I was in the room with her. She couldn't leave her. She had some trauma to her face, and there was some trauma from being sexually assaulted. Um, she just stuck me. She just struck me as being my own. And here I was charged with caring for her. And so I took care of her as if she was my own. And she's going to be really important to this because as Jennifer starts to wake up, she's deathly afraid of male doctors and of the police officers. Well, yeah, of course. Of course. Right? Yeah, I wouldn't expect her to trust it, it, probably anybody but her mom. Or right. Her grandma or something like now, that. Like they I, don't I, know. They don't know that he told her right. that he was a cop. All they know is that she doesn't want to be around male uh, doctors or male police officers. Yeah. It's going to get to the point where she doesn't want to be around police officers at all. And when they start the investigation, the only way that she'll participate in the investigation is passing notes through a door while the cops stay on the other side of the door. Now, another part I forgot to mention in this was that the attacker, she will remember that he offered her candy. And one of the things that went through her head was she was told never to take candy from strangers, but she was also told to always trust the police. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some conflicting messages there. Yeah. Again, again, just terrible, terrible. What a despicable, despicable human being did this. So they, while she's in the football, I mean, while she's in the, um, while she's in the, the hospital, they get out the firefighters and everybody to comb this field to figure out if there's any evidence out there. Mm. And what they're going to do is find her panties balled up with his shirt and his underwear balled up and thrown down into a ravine with real thick grass. And if you're on our YouTube, you'll see a picture of that. 
So <clears throat> he takes off his underwears that, you know, he did his business in her underwears and his shirt and he throws them and they find this. And again, this is in 1990. Um, so that's going to be put into evidence. Meanwhile, she's getting better and she, they want to get a statement from her. So she begins, she can't talk. She can't talk. So she's going to go ahead and start writing. Now she's eight. Eight-year-olds just learn how to write at eight. Like you're just making complete sentences barely at eight, right? You're in second grade. Um, I think you do sentence structure in first grade. So maybe she writes down. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember anything except like what I had at lunch and saying the pledge of allegiance or something like that in first and second grade. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember much of anything at that point. Yeah. DNA was not a thing at this, at this time, especially not in a very small department like this. And remember in the nineties, we don't have interwebs. These guys aren't emailing neighboring jurisdictions. There's not this like, yeah, yeah. Fax machines, maybe crazy for, outlet for departments that would have them. Yeah. You know, and this is a three man department. So they, I'm, and I'm guessing they don't get a lot of crime. So they're not going to get a lot of practice at shit like this. Um, okay. So she starts writing these letters. Go ahead. Uh, show up the first one real quick. She knew that she remembered his name. She just started writing um, for these officers. And I mean, dude, you got to put your brain inside of an eight year old. And look at this. I mean, it's really fascinating stuff here. She says, white. He put his glasses, a sharp plastic brown. I can't read that word. What does that say? Knife? knife? Can it? Pocket knife. Pocket knife. Yep. One or less. Not too green, black mustache, young 30s. Go yeah. ahead. Go to the next piece of paper. He said he was undercover cop, big gun. He's aid. I don't have my gun badge right now. Go to the next one. She draws a picture of his face with a little tiny scar on it with a blackness under his eye. That's really, that's crazy. That's crazy, right? Like, cause the drawing is so simple, but yet you're like, oh, so this guy's got a scar on his face. Like I can look right. at that and go, oh. So I kind of know what I'm looking for, even though that drawing was so simplistic. Simple. Um, <clears throat> it was nice that gold and white, some packages, some packages, red and white. So she's right now, she's describing two boxes of cigarettes. One that was a Marlboro that was gold and white and one Marlboro pack of Marlboros white. that was red and white. Marlboro Marlboros. Reds. Yeah. So he had two. Things. She also writes, and I don't know if I, I, she also write, uh, she's also going to write, I think we, um, uh, I, I told uh, him not to use that other piece of paper. No, you can keep that one up, uh, Elijah. But the other one before this that I had him actually delete because I just didn't want to put too much on here. It actually says beer and it said Buddy Light or something yeah. like that. <laughs> so she was able to, to, to recall that the can of beer that was in his car said Bud Light. Yeah. Um, here's what it said. No, he said, I work at the garage and Dickinson police and Galveston police, blue jeans, black shirt, Marlboro red and white. Wow. Like, again, this is an eight year old writing this stuff. Um, she wrote the color uh, of his eyes, I guess is what drew breezy's down here saying. Um, but she does a really great job talking about all these things they're going to bring in a girl named lewis gibson she's going to be a rookie she's a she draws pictures of of suspects and at this time she'll if you hear her statement she says at this time you know the composite sketches wasn't something that they really believed in in the 90s mm -hmm. and that you you weren't really taken seriously and you were rarely used so much so that they almost got rid of the job altogether wow so she gets called in, I think from Houston to come in and work this case. And she gets there and she meets Jennifer. And all of a sudden she knows that this is probably the most important case she'll ever work in her entire life. Mm -hmm. And she has to get it right. And she's a rookie and everybody hates her. And the stakes couldn't get higher. 
Wow. So imagine we talk about the stars aligning. Imagine if this would have been a veteran. One that was just like, oh, I'm going to take a composite sketch with these things. You know, the burnt out veteran, these yeah. composite sketches never really work. We're never really, you know, we can never really get a good enough detail, especially from an eight year old that can only write, write for I've me done, on this piece I've of paper at eight hundred of these things. I've done 1300 of these things and I'm never even halfway close. Yeah. And so I'm not going to give a shit on this. I'm just going to do my thing. You know what I mean? But no, they bring in this rookie who is like, I got to get this fucking right. I got to get this right, baby. So she starts off at the top, working her way down. She wants to know the top of this guy's hair and she's working with, um, and she's working with Jennifer and uh, Jennifer says when Lewis came in, she had these books where she would go through and for me to really look at the different types of eyes, different types of nose, mouths, and together they would come up with a sketch as they would do this. Lewis Gibson said, I draw like a printer. I start from the top and I go down. First, she gives me the hair. It's brown hair. She gives me the hairstyle. Then she picks up some really dark eyebrows and eyes. And then she picked up a normal nose. Now, remember, she's never done this with a girl who can't talk. And I think this is a brilliant idea. Like literally, like let's just go through a whole book full of different eyes, nose, and eyebrows, and we'll just pick out as we go. Mm -hmm. Pretty great idea. She picks up some dark eyebrows, some dark eyes. She then picks out a normal nose, nondescript. She picks out a mustache. Then they go to the lips, and then the chin, and then the stubble. She notices the scar. She puts it on the left side. And they do this sketch for a little over an hour. And when she saw it, she looked and she looked at that painting and she looked at Lois and she gave her a thumbs up with a very scared and frightened look as if Lois had just drawn a perfect picture of her attacker. Wow. Damn, Jennifer that's, gets that's out of the, that's just, that's just insanely impressive. Like that, that to translate the tr to translate this into a photo from a nonverbal child who just endure this is just crazy to me. It's We're going to put these Mindful. sketches. I'm going to put these sketches up on our Instagram. So head over to failure to stop Instagram and or Facebook. Um, and we're going to post all these pictures up on there. Uh, as you will see later on, they're going to find the driver's license of the attacker. And you can see that picture right there in front of you, Mike. Yeah. Pretty awesome. So that's, Pretty awesome. that's where the sketch ends up. The driver's license compared to the. No. So, so let me, let me finish the story here because I kind of jumped ahead there with, uh, Elijah got a little bit excited. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so she, they come up with this great drawing and she's like, that's him, but they don't have any suspects. They post the picture up and, and it doesn't really go anywhere. Um, and, and about 10 years are going to go by. Nothing's going to happen Jeez. in that 10 years. She's now 18. She can talk. She can talk. And she, she quotes, once I learned to talk, I knew that God had given me my voice back and I didn't shut up and I still haven't shut up ever since. I've never stopped talking. Hmm. She's a victim advocate. She doesn't consider herself a victim. She considers herself to just be victorious. And she's going to work with this detective who's going to eventually retire. And his name was Detective Garcia. And he's going to pass this on to another detective named Tim Crone. And Tim Crone gets this case, uh, and, and Tim Crone at this time, I think, was a 17-year police veteran, um, 11 years as a detective, I think, if I remember correctly. And he worked in the special crimes unit. So basically their homicide unit, but they probably didn't have enough homicides to actually call it a homicide unit. <laughs> right. So he's going to take the case, and he brings Jennifer back in, which, by the way, Jennifer's grandfather up until the time he died, went into the police station every single week to ask for an update mm. until he passed. Mm. So this Tim Crone, he sits down with Jennifer and he starts going through the case. Now, this is 18 years later okay. that he's going to sit down with her. Okay. So, uh, I think I'm so the, the, right. the, salt, the salty veteran... Was, After 15 years is like on the um, case after for yeah, 15 years, whatever he's there. He's not the, there's no more leads. 
Okay, I mean, just went cold. How active are they actually pursuing this? Because crime doesn't stop, right? Like it piles, it piles, right. it piles, whatever. How actively are you really going after that at that point? He passes the open case on to the next guy who then finally sits down with Jennifer. Is that what was it 18 years later? Yeah. So Detective Garcia goes on to say, as time is progressing, the leads are getting colder and colder and you're losing your resources. It's very frustrating. The case just goes cold. Uh, as the years pass, the attack was always in the back of Jennifer's her brain. I mean, she was traumatized from this from day one, and she wanted nothing more in life than to find this guy. And she knew she was going to find him. Um, every day growing up for me in the town of Dickinson was like, I was on a hunt looking for a suspect thinking it could be anyone. This could be our new neighbor. This could be someone at the post office, someone at the grocery store. Is he watching me? Is he going to come back and finish me off? And as normal as I tried to live life, just the unknown could drive me crazy at times. Just not knowing who would do something like this to me. So 10 years after the attack, she graduates, she goes to college. Eventually, uh, she becomes a children librarian at a local library. She loves the job. 15 years after the attack, she meets her, uh, her now husband, Jonathan. Um, and then 18 years after the attack, uh, when she thought she wouldn't hear anything else, she gets a call from detective Tim Crone, who's been past the case from this other detective. That's just a cold case. This guy's going to retire. Tim Crone's going to go through his books, look at this case, open it up, take a look at it. And he's like, huh, I'm going to bring her in. I'm going to look at this, this evidence. And he sees that in the evidence, they have freaking panties and underwear. Right. And he's like, holy shit, this is 2009. So he calls up a special agent from the FBI, a buddy of his. And he, this guy's name is Richard Renison. And he's like, yo, I've got this case. I'd like to team up with you, bud, on this. What can you do? So he takes the uh, the evidence and he takes it back to uh, a DNA lab in Quantico. It was 2.30 in the morning. My phone rings and it's the DNA lab. The DNA, uh, the DNA examiner told me we got a hit. I said 2.30 nice. in the morning. Wow. So when people say that cops don't do shit, you know, we do the best we can, but this stuff gets, a, this is what gets cops going. I've man. never seen cops crimes. help anybody. I've never seen a little shout out to the giggle boys there. Um, when I heard the name Dennis Earl Bradford as our offender, my first response was who, who is that? We never saw that name in any of the reports. Um, but at the same time, it was really exciting phone call to say, this is all from his quotes to say that we got a match and that the person was out there. So he calls Tim crony. He's like, yo, Dennis Earl Bradford. Lieutenant Cromie's like, who is Dennis Earl Bradford? He goes back through all of the notes. I don't know if you have this note, but she wrote in her note one of those crazy sketches, which I will put on our Instagram. He's going through the notes that she had written on paper and one page of notes. It said, he said his name was D-I-N-N-E-S-E. The detective wrote parentheses pronounced Dennis D E N N I S. What? She wrote that in her notes when she was eight years old, that his name was Dennis. Now they have a DNA match that goes to some dude in Arkansas whose name is Dennis Earl Bradford. Wow. Dennis Earl Bradford had been arrested in the late 90s in 1997 for guess what? Rape. Kidnapping and rape. Oh, geez. And attempted to slit her throat and chickened out according to her. He was hanging out at a bar in Arkansas with a female who he struck up a nice conversation with and asked if she would like to go on a drive with him and listen to his new Ozzy Osbourne cassette tape. I always knew that guy was a bad influence, biting the heads off bats, Black so, Sabbath. Yeah. Jeez. Never get in a car with a dude that wants to go for a drive. Satan with is a pretty confirmed. young lady. I know when the first drive I took with my wife, we listened to the Twilight soundtrack. I don't. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm. I guess I'm happy to know that I don't know what's on there. <laughs> There's a lot of good songs. It's a lot better than the Passion of Christ soundtrack. <laughs> Touche. A lot better. 
So he picks her up at this bar. He takes her on a drive, goes, pulls into a nice romantic spot to just talk, according to her. And then he jumps over on top of her, grabs her by the neck and begins to strangle her. They wrestle and fall out of the car. He gets on top of her and chokes her till she passes out. She wakes up to him holding a knife up to her throat. And she's like, said something like, what are you going to do? Fucking kill me. And she's like, get off me, bitch. Or something like that. And he looks and she's like, what are you too fucking scared to do it? And he puts her back in the car and drives her back. What? So she goes and tells the police he gets sentenced. He pleads guilty. With he very is very little scared. contest. He couldn't, he couldn't do it. He can only pick on an eight year old girl. Right. He got too scared when it was, when it was an adult that was talking back. Right. So he gets, he, he gets sentenced to 12 years in prison. Doesn't do one day over four years. What? Gets sentenced to seven years in prison. Doesn't do a day over four. What? How does someone try to kill another human being and do four years? Mm -hmm. What? See, this is a problem. So when people do say that we have a problem with the criminal justice system, I 100% agree. But it's not systemic racism. And it's not corrupt cops. It's not police brutality. It is the total and rampant insanity that is inconsistency with sentencing in this country like it is it is like you might as well just roll a dungeons and dragon dice and see what happens it's it's nuts dude there should be one punishment for trying to kill another human you don't ever go into society again that's sure. it sorry give your life to jesus you can worship him in there in behind those walls like, I don't know, play basketball, do whatever you're going to do. Uh, make license plates. I don't know, but you're not coming out here. No, there's a consequence to trying to kill people and trying to rape them. Oh my gosh, man. that. So what the detective has at this point in time, what just being in Galveston, this? Texas, I'm making a note, I'm making a note and it's more than a mental note. It is literally, it is literally a note that's physical. And I'm going to find out what judge, and then I'm going to put them in the hall of shame. Yeah. Fuck that guy. Agreed. Uh, we should do that. We should just do like a judge, sh like a shameful judge Dude, of the week type we deal. Should, we should have a hall of shame. Because there's a lot like of shit. Like Instagram highlights. We no, I don't. I don't know what that you means. You know how you can do Instagram highlights? Well, we only have the basic plan. Yeah, I didn't subscribe <laughs> to the good plan. You can't do any of that cool stuff. Oh. Bro, you can't even get my pictures that I text you to not be blurry. So <laughs> I don't want to hear about that. Just kidding. Okay. Now go kill yourself. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was said for entertainment and education purposes only. <laughs> it was comedy. Um, <clears throat> serious comedy. So the detective now has DNA on these underwears that are to a guy named Dennis. Well, hold, he has hold a, note. a second, though. Who's this salty veteran that was holding on to these underwear that had to have known prior to 2009, prior to turning it over to Tim Cone? Coney? I don't Crony, remember. yep. Crone or Crony? Crony. Crony. Okay. He had to have known that DNA was a thing by then, right? I mean, okay, so YouTube came out. This is like I like to reference everything. YouTube came out in 2006 and was like failing hard. Yeah. Like there was there was no such thing as a vlogger until late 2006 and the first vlogger that ever came out you know who it was? No. It was a wine vlogger. He vlogged about wine. Gary V? Gary V. He was the first video vlogger of all time. <clears throat> and those videos are crazy I, I used to watch them back in 2007 because i was a big wine guy so uh still am but anyway so you think about 2006 7 8 9 i mean we still had flip phones in 2007 2008 yeah but dna evidence was a thing yeah i'm, I'm sure it was but if you're from butt fucking nowhere galveston texas i mean you don't know what you don't know i'm sure he didn't know i guess Jeez. you know what i mean well how did chromie know 
Because he's a little bit younger and he's not retired. Yeah, I think he missaid said retarded. Well, also think about it this way. How many cold cases does that dude have or how many cases is he working? And how many times did he had looked at that through the 90s and just finally kind of gave up on it? Jeez. I guess that's the point. But anyway, <sighs> they luckily, he's now sitting on all this evidence. So again, the evidence is underwear, have DNA, come to a dentist. And, her, and her writing when she was eight that his name was Dennis. That his I name mean, was Dennis. That's and great. the dude was in prison and gave his DNA because of a case that he tried to strangle a woman and slit her fucking throat. Huh, yeah. So pretty good. But now they just need a way to get him from Arkansas to Texas, and they need a way to kind of tie it all together. When they say I need a way to tie it together, I think it's already tied together. But I guess being a good detective and just due diligence and just not wanting to lose this case under any circumstances, he calls Galveston, Texas, and asks for a driver's license. So go ahead and show the driver's license with that sketch. And then they pull up the sketch and they pull up the driver's license. How nuts is that? I mean, dude, I've never seen a composite sketch so close in my life. I've been watching like Unsolved Mysteries for a long time. Yeah, it's like a it's like a murderous Freddie Mercury. It, exactly. It does look like a lot like Freddie Mercury. Um, so they end up bringing, they, they end up arresting him. Now when they arrest him, you know, old Dennis Earl Bradford, he's married with two children. Oh. And the, they quote as imagine being the wife of this dude, finding this out or he's his kids. Talk about your total <laughs> screwing with your mind. Imagine finding out your dad did this. I know it's nuts. I'd kill you. Yeah, I would, <laughs> and you, and I would parents. deserve it. Yeah. Um. So, yes, yeah, she's. They actually, I think they did an episode of "I Married a Murderer" with with that family on it. You could probably go watch that. So, um. The cops even say he looked very unassuming, like just looked like a normal guy. Go ahead and show his arrest like photo. Looks a dad getting a hot dog, standing in line at the at the softball game. Yeah, definitely does not look like, you know, like a Gacy or somebody. It like also a, looks like someone I'd like to jam this pen in his neck. Right. So it's going to get a little bit worse for you here. Oh, my gosh. They now uh, take this homeboy, and they go ahead and they interrogate him. Doesn't last very long or interview. I'm sorry. I can't say interrogate, uh, play the, in, the interview tape for us real quick. Do you ever have occasion to come in contact with her? Yes. Tell me about that. No. <laughs> Hold on. My whole life for the past 20 years has been utterly and completely because of my mistake. Mistake? I tell, obviously, it's special life, but I think you would, if you were to see her, I think you would be extremely proud of her. I really do. So go ahead and stop it really fast. Just pause it really first. Pause it for a second. So they tell him, they ask him about her, if he knows her name. Uh, and he says he, he is familiar with her. And they said, you want to tell, talk to us about it? And he says, no. And then they're going to go on and say, like, look, dude, we've got your underwear. We've got your shirt. We've got your DNA. Uh, and he breaks down. And he says, you know, for 20 years, I have been, my life has been really fucked up because I made that one mistake. <laughs> Keep playing the tape. Now he's finding out for the first time that she's alive. Oh, yeah, good for you. Real sense of relief. Hold on. Now go die in hell. Just wait. Oh, God. That's Chromie to the left. 
All these detectives need to go on a diet, by the way. Side note. Well, you have no idea how hard it is. I am praying for that. Oh, oh yeah, God answered your prayer? I'm a believer of Christ. Oh. No, you're not! No! Oh. No, no, you're not! No idea. I'm a firm believer in Christ that it hid what I thought was a murder. Now, in, later on in the interview, he keeps crying and he says, I'm so sorry, Mama. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I did this, Mama. Never once does he say sorry to her. Never once does he mention or say her name. No, because it's all about him. But he says, he I'm feels. sorry, Mama, because he borrowed his mother's car that night. Yeah. <sighs> Jeez. I hope he believes that he's going to go to hell. So he doesn't want a jury trial. He wants to plead guilty. He wants to get it going as fast as he can. Uh, she is. Well, he, he doesn't want to suffer for a bunch of years like she did. Huh. So they, they call Jennifer and they say, Jennifer, we have arrested Dennis Earl Bradford and the connection of your attempted murder and rape. And you can just imagine this sense of relief and that this weight of all of this just coming off of her back where she can no longer have to walk around looking over her back, fearing if the guy's still out there, thinking about, is he doing this to other women? Mm -hmm. And it's just this <clears throat> amazing, just like no more stress over this. Mm -hmm. They get, they, they want, she wants to meet face to face. And so they say that they can't do that, but they, put her in front of a window to see him, but he can't see her. <clears throat> and she said all that she did was just watched him and watched him. She didn't say anything. She watched his every move as he sat there and rubbed his head and paced around the room. She just kept watching him. And she wrote a victim statement. Uh, uh, a, um, what do they call it? Jimmy, a uh, victim, victim impact, impact statement. statement. Yeah. And she was ready to do this in court. They had told her that he doesn't want a jury trial. He's going to confess. He does confess. And, and that he's actually going to confess fully in court. And, um, and, it, and, and it's a slam dunk, girl. You got it. And you did it. You're the one that wrote down all of this information, you know, about him. You gave the perfect thing. <clears throat> uh, in his confession, he says, not a single day goes by where I don't see that baby. Good. There's no other side to the story. She was an innocent, and I was a sick, deranged, beat-up little fucking punk. Yeah. Here he goes on to say, she wasn't anybody I knew. I don't remember why I pulled up into those apartments. Bradford told us that he was driving around one night and he randomly pulled into that parking lot. He walked over to the windows and he saw that her window was open and that there was a light on and that she was just laying there sleeping. And so he picks her up and he this, takes her and he this, says, I'm ready for this to be over. On, that, like, like you yeah. said, kind of goes back to the beginning of what are the chances of yard work to mosquito bites to mom sending you to your own room to stop scratching and waking her up to turning the light on to being, you know, visible because of that to this random guy pulling into the lot and being a complete disgusting slob of a human. He goes on, he says, I'm ready for this to be over. I'm sick and tired of looking over my shoulder and being afraid. He says, okay, forgive me, mama. I pulled that little girl out of the window I put her in my car and she was freaking out. And I told her, please just don't worry. It'll be all right. I told that little girl that I was a police officer and that everything would be okay. I pulled off on this little road and that little girl, she was so scared. I lost it. I was like a savage animal. I can't, I can't force myself to say it. Rene, the, the detective says, uh, this has been haunting you your whole life, Dennis. Come on. Uh, let's hear it. Let's hear it. He says, I took that little girl out there and I raped her and I cut her throat. I don't know why. I've never known why. Many, many, many times 
many times I've just wanted to kill myself. I've just never had the guts. Yeah, he's a coward. He said uh, he told him that that he had stuck a gun up to his head one time to commit suicide, but he jerked the cruiser and he blew a hole in his dad's roof with a thirty odd six. Uh, from there he was booked and he was ready to give his confession in court and Jennifer was ready to finally get to look her killer in the eyes and read this statement that she worked very hard on except the night before trial he hung himself in his jail room couldn't and couldn't th- even face her at the no. end and so they called Jennifer and they said Christian my ass hey he unfortunately killed himself no it's prison. not unfortunate Well, it was for her. She broke down screaming and crying. Please, no, please don't let him. Don't let him kill himself. Stop him. And they were like, it's too late. He's fucking dead. And so she had lived her whole life for that moment. Yeah. To talk to this guy, to tell him how she felt. And again, he took that away from her. I mean, you can't fathom the emotions I mean, you, you can't fathom it. You can't. You, there's, there's no way you can. Uh, yeah, he there's, there's nothing ever, you can say. He, there was never a moment he was sorry for any of this. No. That, that proves it. Right. There was never a moment he was actually willing to face the music, actually willing to, to look the person in the eye who was weak and incapable of stopping him in some sense, in the physical sense, but she was more than capable of stopping him. She was smarter than him. She was more courageous than him. Oh, yeah. She was she was more uh, clear headed, more virtuous, all of those things better than him. And that coward couldn't look her in the eye at the end. Jeez. So she decides on August 10th, 20 years, 20 years to the day, August 10th, 1990. I mean, August uh, 10th, um, 2010. Uh, 20 years to the day she goes to his grave and she sits down at his grave and she reads him his victim statement. Now the overpay producer uh, subscribed to some kind of docu thing that we were able to look up this victim's impact statement and and I'm going to read it. Um, I don't care if it's four pages long. I think it's important. And if you've joined us for this long, before I read that victim impact statement, that is super powerful. Uh, I'd like to just take one quick moment to mention Express VPN and thank them so much for being with us. Um, this was our, you know, we're coming up on our one year anniversary of being a podcast. Um, and it, it's, it's not every day that you find a company that wants to promote police officers and law enforcement officers doing uh, anything. So the fact that we have any sponsors, we're super, super thankful. Uh, You know, what's not fair. The fact that Netflix hides thousands of shows and movies from you based on your location and then has the nerve to increase their prices on you. They just raise their prices once again, and you could just cancel your subscription and protest, or you could be smart about it and make sure you're getting your full money's worth by using ExpressVPN like we do. Uh, you might not know that what's on Netflix in your country is completely different from what someone in the UK or Japan has on theirs. Using ExpressVPN, you can control which country you want your Netflix to think you're in. ExpressVPN has over 90 countries to choose from so every time i run out of stuff to watch i just switch to another country to unlock new shows right now i'm watching uh uh god what is the name of that one show um he goes back in time he's like a time traveler guy anyway it's not on netflix here but quantum leap now no i'll think of it in a minute (laughs) but um does alabama transit use express vpn (laughs) he absolutely does hey hey hon (laughs) <laughs> like I'm watching from Vietnam. <laughs> I'm really in Alabama. <laughs> I got three months free. Hey, oh yeah, they- some bitches think I'm Vietnam. <laughs> where, where you at, Craigers? Drop some, drop some. <laughs> 
Uh, Express VPN is super fast. It works on your phone, your laptop, your smart TVs. You can watch shows on the big screen with zero buffering. Uh, stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting access to a fraction of the content. Get your money's worth at expressvpn.com slash Wolfpack. Don't forget to use my link so that you can get an extra three free months. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Wolfpack. ExpressVPN dot com slash Wolfpack. Uh, headed back over here to this victim statement that I really want to read to you guys, and I, and, I, and I hope you stuck around long enough to hear it. It's well worth it. And I think she deserves it. I think everybody should be able to hear it. She didn't get a chance to read it in court. But um, she says, Dennis Bradford, I waited 19 years, two months, and three days to find out your last name and for you to be caught. I knew your first name was Dennis because you told me before you raped me and attempted to murder me on August 10th, 1990. When you cut my throat from ear to ear, you assumed that I would die, or if I lived, I wouldn't be able to talk. Well, you chose the wrong little 45-pound 8-year-old girl to try and murder because for 19 years, I've thought of you every single day and helped in searching for you. Every year that passed has given me more strength and drive for when I finally would be face-to-face -face with you as I am today. Some may feel sad for me that it took 19 years to track you down, but I'm only sad for the others that have fallen victim to you. Wondering how you could be capable of committing such horrendous acts on such an innocent and frail little girl as I was back in August 10th, 1990. And knowing others could be harmed by you or what has bothered me the most all, I, all of these years. I didn't know who you were or where you were, but in my heart, I knew you were out there alive, either in prison or living a lie. And now I know listening to my heart all of these years and never giving up on finding you, I was right. All of this time, you have been living a lie keeping your secret of who you really are to yourself. Every year I spent trying to find you and bring you to justice. You spent thinking that you got away with it, what you did to me. You thought you got away with creeping into the window of an apartment lived in by a single mother and daughter and then kidnapping, raping, and almost succeeding at murdering me. Just an innocent little girl peacefully sleeping in the middle of the night. On the first night in my life, I had gone to sleep in my own bed. When I couldn't fight to get away from you, what a cowardly way to commit a crime. I hope you had sleepless nights filled with nightmares and spent every day looking over your shoulder all of these years. After telling me you were an undercover police officer and telling me your gun was in the back seat of your vehicle and me curiously leaning over the front seat to look into the back, I can still think back and feel the fear I had inside of me at that very moment when you ripped my panties off of me and laid me down in the front seat of that vehicle and started to lick me. As an eight-year-old child, I didn't know what you were doing, but I knew it was wrong. I knew at the moment that you didn't know my family, and I didn't, and and I knew that you were not a police officer, like you had said. In my mind, I tried to imagine what I could do to escape you because I feared for my life, but knew that I wouldn't be able to get away because I wouldn't be strong enough or fast enough. As if putting your grown man hands around my little neck and choking me repeatedly and raping me wasn't enough. You continued to play out your nightmarish fantasy. You slit my throat, and as you dragged me by my ankles through the brush and thorns, I did what came as first instinct to me. I played dead. You thought you killed me. You thought you had won this sick game you started, but again, you were wrong. You left me there in a fire ant pile like I was nothing, like I was an old rag doll you had discarded in a field of trash, having your fun torturing me. Well, all know the details. We all know the details. But as I remember, for over 14 years, I laid there in that field, bleeding to death, helpless, but not alone. I had angels sitting next to me. Even though I could not scream, I could not get up. I couldn't do anything physically as fire ants stung me all over my body. There was one thing I could do, pray for strength and survive. Luckily, those prayers were answered. The choices you made in the early morning hours of August 10th, 1990 have impacted my life and changed me forever. Before August 10th, 1990, I was a free-spirited little girl. I can't remember ever even being afraid or living in fear besides always being afraid of the dark, as most children are at that age. You changed that. By the time I was released from the hospital, we didn't even live in our own home anymore. You put such a fear into myself and my family that I didn't even get to go home to the home that I had known for almost five years. My mother and I had to move in with my grandparents. I had to be escorted to and from school. And instead of being my usual carefree self, I lived with anxiety and what I know now as PTSD. 
I didn't know what those things were then. I don't even know if anyone ever explained it to me for sure. But looking back on it, I realize now that me not sleeping in my own bed until 15, me living in fear of you coming back and hurting myself or my mother and me wanting to do anything without my mother. I wasn't like other normal children, even though my mother tried to make our life as normal as possible. When I would go in public to the grocery store, doctor's appointments or the mall, everyone in my eyes was a suspect. And it's remained that way until October 13, 2009. For years, I've studied the faces of every male that would pass by because I was sure that I, if I had seen you, I would recognize you. I was scared of my own bed, scared of sleeping, scared of the dark as a child, as a teenager. But during the day, I was constantly looking for you, trying to save others from being attacked by the person that had so viciously attacked me. The only fear I didn't have was doing anything and everything in my power to help in capturing you. I had nightmares for a year or so after you attacked me. And for a short period of time, I can remember being afraid of men. I felt like myself and my family had been violated, but the drive and determination in me to find you has kept me going, knowing one day I'd face you. And I know that you would never hurt another person has kept me going. Also, since the age of five, my dream was to grow up and be a mommy of eight boys. You also have changed that dream. For years after you attacked me, I knew something was medically wrong with me and I have gone to various doctors and finally I found out two years ago after undergoing tests and surgery that my medical issues are a result of your brutally attacking me and that it medically made it medically impossible for me to conceive children without the help of, in, of a fertility doctor and treatments. As a child, I can also remember locking myself in the restroom and sitting on the bathroom counter staring at the long, ugly red scar on my neck left by you, taking a knife and cutting me from one ear to another and asking myself what I had done for someone to do such horrible things to me as an elementary student at the time and having to have a tube down my throat for part of my third grade year. Children and adults were curious and I was constantly asked questions of what happened to me and why. How was I, as an eight-year-old, supposed to answer questions that I didn't even have the answers to? Because of the tube in my throat, I couldn't participate in physical education like all the other children. But instead, I would sit in the nurse's office for an hour every day while the other children got to play. As a college student, I was nervous walking to and from classes in the parking lots, always frightened and worried about someone attacking or following me. I have suffered anxiety attacks at night in the past years so bad that I cannot breathe, and I sit up for hours trying to calm myself down. But today... I sit in front of you as a 28-year-old woman, and I would like you to know that I am not a victim because of what happened 20 years ago. Your plan on the night of August 10th, 1990 was not the same plan that God had for me. You may have taken away my voice for a short period of time, and you may have taken away a piece of me being an innocent, and I will never get that back, but you've never taken away my strength or my will to survive. I have waited for this day for 20 years of my life and hope you now feel as weak as you made me feel all of those years ago as a child. While you played out your fantasy on my tiny body and attacked me, you made me feel this small. Today, I hope you feel this small sitting in front of me because I definitely feel like the strong one. In life, we have choices, and I made a choice early on to not let this negative and traumatic experience define me. Instead, I turned the attack into something positive for not only myself, but others by using my voice to speak out against crime in hopes that myself and other survivors will conquer crime one voice at a time. Dennis Bradford, I am not your vic victim. I am victorious. Um, anyway, uh, she closes it up. I'm not going to keep going, but I'll just read her the last paragraph. This event in my life 19 years ago was a tragic one, but today, 19 years later, I stand here and want you all to know that I am okay. I'm not a victim, but instead I'm victorious. To the media and public, I appreciate your interest in my case. I thank you wholeheartedly for keeping my case alive throughout all these years. Now that I have received the news and arrest has been made, and while pending prosecution, I ask you that you please respect mine and my family. You know, obviously she didn't get that opportunity because right. he's dead. But uh, here's where the story just finishes off. After she reads that, she turns to her husband, whom she now has two children with, thanks to technology. And she says, do you think he heard any of that? And before she could answer, she went, ow, and she reached down and her foot was in a fire ants pile. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was saying, I, I was hoping that if there was a moment where demons could escort him to his graveside to force, force him to listen to that, or angels, I should say, because whatever you know 
force him held his held his ghostly eyes open and ears open to to make him listen to her. Uh, I hope so. I want to end it with this question for you, Mike. Um, this guy is buried in Johnson City, Johns, Johnson City Masonic Cemetery in Blanco County, Texas. The memorial ID where the uh, stone is at is one nine nine three two five seven nine nine. If anybody wants to take an Amber Heard, um, that's in Harris County, Texas, USA. So, uh, my question is. So the guy killed himself and didn't get to have a sentence. A sentencing. He's got a gravestone. It's got two praying hands across. It says Dennis Earl Bradford, uh, 1969, 2010, with a pair of cowboy boots, a weeping angel, and some other artifacts and relics left behind from family. No. Um, oh, here. So, so this is funny. I'm on. I'm actually on his uh, grave finder app, and it says the purple flower. This is written by somebody. It says, I have left a pansy for you, Dennis, because you were a coward from the beginning to the end. What you did will always be remembered, and I pray your victims are able yes. to live healthy lives. Uh, so it looks like somebody uh, has already done that. I would go and leave a fucking shit right in those boots. Uh, that's what I would like to do. But um, do you think that if you were being convicted of something that heinous, you're found guilty of it, you committed suicide, and I think that they should not give that body to the family. And I think it should be in an unmarked grave somewhere that nobody knows. A hundred percent. No, he's, not, wor he's not worth being remembered. At all, period. No. I don't like it that he gets to have a gravestone out. They just toss him in the ocean. Bye. Yeah, Sorry. that's what they did with uh, Bin Laden. I mean, I feel, I feel like terrible for his kids and his wife having... I don't. Fuck them. Well, not them. I mean, they, they didn't know. No, I'm saying like, imagine being those kids that they don't mean they don't need to, they don't deserve to be victims anymore. Nah, in the whole bloodline, did. dude, in that whole bloodline. Yeah, I mean that's one way to do it, but uh, I'm yeah. just kidding. By the way, Kings Kings Con. <laughs> <laughs> Tansy Khan, <laughs> the br brutal revenge of Can Tansy Khan. What is the best in life? A couple of wow, fans. what a story, dude. Wow, yeah. Uh, Matt McGee, thank you for the super chat. It is not unnoticed. Craig Dolesky coming in hot. Who's dropping in 99 bucks? Dude, bro. Is that Craigers? Thank you guys for putting an awesome show. Oh, thank we work you guys for Craig. For both of that. I like to think that Craig is like some 14 year old dude that had that's uh that's, oh, away, it's like blank that's away at military school <laughs> and his dad is like the owner of some oil rig in the Gulf and just he's got like access to funds and he's just spending it on us. I like no, to think I that. like to think it is as like <laughs> his parents were like you know, like they're living up this like rich, lavish, best life. And they're like, yeah, go off to military school, little Dolesky. And they, and he, like, you're right. He has that card and he's just like that movie blank check where he's just like living it lavish. Good for him. Oh my gosh. Um, Thank you guys. Somebody else left 49 bucks. Matt McGahey. McGee. Is that what? Pl click that again. Real we quick. Mentioned it. <laughs> Wait, I mentioned it. Thanks for listening. Matt Mc oh. Mc McGahey. McGahey. Yeah. McGahey. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Happy Pride Month, McGahey. Happy Pride Month. Whew. Okay, what are the let's wrap this up with some oh, boy. We have we have extended the range of our emotions, but let's see what you can say in Pride Month that you can't say any other month. Sure, this is a library. You gotta lift your skirt to show your penis. <laughs> uh, my tapeworm is my co-pilot. <laughs> Speaking of happy endings, it's Pride Month, Ben Marsh. <laughs> Chad Turner says, "Have you have you been a good boy for Stana? <laughs> you can't say that in June and not at that. No, 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 no. That shouldn't have been allowed. Should have been discarded that one. <laughs> uh, what's Ruben say? Oh no, never mind. Teresa, I keep asking what LGBTQ stand for, but no one will give me a straight answer. Oh my god, <laughs> I'm so gay I can't even drive straight. <laughs> what was the last? Oh. I didn't know. It back, 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 back. Uh, he made an executive decision. Wow, what a what a roller coaster of emotions this one was." Yeah, dude. she's a she's a boss, dude. I really wanted to have her on. Um, if you get a chance, go over and um, check out the forty eight hours interview with her. Um, yeah, dude, she's she's a boss, dude. And I'm glad she has two beautiful kids. She's got a daughter and a son. Yeah, so. man, amazing. I would love to. One of the things that I would love to see for our show in the future, and I'm sure that the audience will agree, is that 
as we sort of like unpack these stories over over the coming uh, what we've done so far and what's to come that man we could find people involved whether it's uh, detective chromie or you know like yeah. or even jennifer herself obviously like having just conversations with these people to go back and and hear from them uh from from the people who lived it and not just us telling this but man i think hopefully you know next week when we try out this new thing we'll have to see if it works out but you know, I think we're really going to grow this Tuesday night show. And I think we have a way that we can really make this night shift more of a true crimey story time. We're not going to have like rando guests that, you know, come in and tell funny stuff. I think we're going to make this like a very night shifty cold case type thing, but we're going to bring in a real expert next week and uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. See so how it plays tuned, out for everybody. Stay, stay listen stay in. Tuned. And guys, if you like the show, there's still 122 of you, it says. It tells me watching. If you haven't done so, hit the like button on your way out, please, uh, and subscribe to the channel if you found this valuable. And if you like the show, wherever you're listening to it, Apple Podcast, Spotify, hit the follow or subscribe button so that it automatically delivers to you. Drop a rating, a review, uh, and tell a friend about the show uh, if you like what we're doing. And we think it's kind of unique. There's not a lot of true crime going out there with two former cops breaking down cases and giving you our perspective on things with uh, some of our reverent humor, you know, yeah, and, and listen, I think and, we're and more and Christians all the different, than Dennis, but uh, nobody has different styles of shows like we do. The disruptors today. Wow. Killer. Did combos, you listen to man. it. Uh, I'm like, hear I am at three quarters through. Dude, so good. Yeah, man. That that guys, they are killing it. That guy could be my best friend. Let me tell you about my bad friend. All right. Well, I'll get all these Woo! pictures up on the Instagrammies. So for those of you who don't want to go to YouTube to look at all the pictures, just head on over to our Instagram. Give us a follow. There you go. You know the drill. You know what you got to do. Yeah. Until next time, it's happy Pride Month. <laughs>